Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of There's Just Something About Kansas City, where we're in conversation about the people, places, and things that make this such a great place to live. And boy, are you in for a treat today. <laughs> My good buddy, Mike Garozo from Garozo's Restaurantory, of course. How you doing, Mike? And my good friend. How are you? I'm doing great, Frank. Doing great. Uh, my, I'm just coming off the disabled list after my last <laughs> knee surgery, and I'm I'm back on the on, on the golf circuit. So I'm a happy man again. Well, I'll, I'll bet you are. And I understand Maggie, your wife, uh, of almost 40 years now. We talk about that in a little while. Um, she's really gotten into the game, huh? Oh my God, she's addicted so bad, Frank. We just uh, <laughs> we went on a golf. Just got back last week. We got back Saturday. We were gone all last week. We were in Sea Island, Georgia. What a beautiful, beautiful piece of the world. And we were at this great resort there. It's actually the sister hotel of the Broadmoor out in uh, Colorado. Colorado Springs. Mm-hmm. And it's every bit as elegant. And the, the courses are great and everything. So we went. Uh, we flew in Monday, and we played Monday afternoon, <laughs> Wednesday, and then Friday we got rained out. Well, everybody but Maggie got rained out. <laughs> Maggie, <clears throat> Maggie, Maggie, and Bonnie. Bonnie didn't even play when she saw the forecast. I got out there. We, me, and Keith and Maggie, Keith and Bonnie Connells, who we went with, they're a pretty well known couple here. They're great. They're our best friends, and. We went with them, and um, so it was going to be me, Maggie, and Keith, and um, we're on the putting green right before the first tee, taking some extra putts and getting ready to tee off. It starts coming down rain, (laughs) and I'm like, I'm looking at the radar. This isn't letting up. I'm like, I'm done. I don't golf in the rain in Kansas City. This is a neat place. I'll find plenty to do all day. Mm -hmm. Go rehab my knee or something like that, and... And Keith says, well, I'm going to try and play a couple holes. This this might let up. Keith plays two holes. He heads for the house. He heads for the house. <laughs> Maggie plays. She continues to play. Then the cab, caddy told her he, he's not playing anymore <laughs> after nine. The caddy quit, so she quit after nine. But she ended up getting sick. She's homesick now. Of course. Yeah, we're actually supposed to go to uh, – the, the owner suite of the Royals as a guest of Tom Freeman, our other good friend. Yeah, our other good our golfing all, buddy. Our other mm-hmm. golf buddy. We've been to Bandon Dunes in Ireland together. All, you with me, Grunhardt. Tim, with mm-hmm. and Timmy. But uh, anyway, uh, we were supposed to go up there with him, and so uh, I guess I'm trying to get my, my daughter Gina to find a babysitter so I have a date tonight because <laughs> Maggie's <laughs> homesick. She hasn't, yeah. She's been sick ever since then, and I said, I told you not to play golf, but uh, she's been under the weather, yeah. so and she never gets sick. So, well, like I told you, folks, you are in for a treat here today. We're going to talk to you a little bit about your your past, where you grew up. We're going to go back to the hill in St. Louis, of course, which the big Italian neighborhood. Talk a little bit about your childhood and how all this started for for Mike Garosa. Okay, well, I I was uh, born and raised on the hill in St. Louis. It's it's one of these, and still is, one of the great Italian communities in, con- in the country. It's the little Italy of St. Louis, and every corner's got a restaurant, a pizzeria, a deli. It's a great place to to grow up. I mean, growing up, all my friends were Italian. You know, I, that's all we knew. And, you know, I grew up in a restaurant family. My dad was a waiter all his life, mm-hmm. so... I started out as a busboy when I was 13 years old. I, we, he worked at a great Italian restaurant, him and my uncle, who um, I'll talk about him later when we get to the restaurant and the menu. But anyway, I started out as a busboy there. The owner was a guy named Lou Perenni, who was a great guy, kind of like one of the great guy characters of St. Louis. Mm-hmm. He Lou was a good-looking guy, sharp dresser, always uh, had beautiful girlfriends, pockets full of money. <laughs> All the football cardinals used to come in there. Mm-hmm. They used to come in there on Sunday nights after the games, 
and we'd serve them cocktails and coffee cups because you couldn't serve liquor on Sundays, on Sundays back in those days. The old blue law. And then back in the 60s. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I so long ago, but... Great. I mean, those guys came in every 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 week. Pat Fisher, Bob DeMarco, Larry Wilson. I mean, great football players. Charlie Johnson, mm -hmm. who was the quarterback before Jim Hart. And anyway, we we knew all the and Lou knew them all. And heck, I'd get tickets. Lou loved me because he loved my dad, and my uncle, and uh, and so he. Uh, He'd always give me a couple tickets to the game because he never went, and they always gave him tickets. Right. I bring one of my buddies to Bush Stadium, and the old Bush Stadium. We used to go to games at Sportsman's Park. Wow. The, the, the original one down on Grand was when they were playing there, before they put the the second Bush Stadium, right. which was t torn down. And we, uh, anyway, I go to the game with my guy. We take the 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 bus to the game, and I tell my buddy, look. If one of the Cardinals screws up, you can't boo him or get mad at him. <laughs> he might be sitting next to his wife. Right. <laughs> the seats were pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I'll bet. But so, so, so you started out, and I mean, you started out ground floor. You started out as a, as a bus boy. As a bus then, boy. Then eventually, did you go to waiter? Yeah. Then? Well, I, I started out at Perenni's. I worked there, you know, 13 years old till I was about 15. And okay. I, and then there was a restaurant called Rich and Charlie's. But I knew at a young age that I wanted to be like Lou Perenni because he, and you know, he was just a, a class. He was a man. He was a. He had a good life, and yeah. I, you know, I wanted to be like Lou, and so I I knew what I wanted to do at a young age and pursued it. So I tried to work at all the best Italian restaurants and the best up and coming. And there was a place called Rich and Charlie's, which was a famous restaurant group. Richard Ronzio and Charlie Mugavero started it. And they got uh, actually got a restaurant, a small deli in, in University City, which was uh, given to them as a tip. L Richard was the bartender, and Charlie was a waiter at a place called Andrino's. And Andrino was one of the guys that spawned a lot of great restaurants off right. of them. Right. Probably in those days, the two greatest were Vince Bomarito and Andrino. And then he had Andrino's, which was right across the street from uh, St. Ambrose. Later on, it became Dominic's, mm -hmm. another classic restaurant. Right. But they were working at Andrino's, and this rich customer who loved Richard and Charlie yes. gave them the restaurant wow. as a tip. Oh, my gosh. Gave them the restaurant. All they had to do was take over the lease. It was a turnkey little deli. And they went in there and started serving great Italian food in there. And then it started growing, and everybody was, all the guys, my Italian buddies from the Hill were working there because they were great guys to work for. And, you know, my dad and my uncles, everybody, they all knew Richard. They all, right. all the Italian guys from the Hill. So uh, we, I went and got a job there because that was the new hot place to work. I was like 16 years old back then, mm -hmm. but, you know, I went through puberty at birth. I had sideburns, and you know, I, You're I was shaving at three. I, 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 I started shaving in eighth grade. One of the nuns. You're was, one of those one guys. Of, one of one of the nuns told me if I didn't shave that mustache by tomorrow, I wouldn't be let in the class. You know, I, uh, I was so happy to get out of eighth grade. I knew it was the last time I was going to get punched by a nun. So. <laughs> I didn't get punched, but I got hit with a lot of, <laughs> a lot, lot, of, of rulers. lot of rulers. Yeah, a lot of rulers. Yeah. 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 So anyway, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I lost my train of thought. I no, it's okay. You're eighth grade. Enough. You got out of eighth grade. Got, uh, shaving. Got, yeah, yes. Yeah. And so I started working at Rich and Charlie's, and after in high they, school, right? And I was in high school. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was playing football and stuff, but I worked there on uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, because you know we. We did working out and stuff on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So right. I worked there. And, it, I mean, this was a small little restaurant, fine dining. We all wore tuxedos. And, you know, I was serving drinks. I looked 21, <laughs> you know. And you're 14. I, I, I was, I, I, no, I was, I, I was 16. Oh, okay. I was 16. All right, fine. But you know, <laughs> anyway. But in those days, and and they were, it was just the place to work. The food and the service. 
there were four, 16 tables. It had a little credenza in there, and it was right up the street from the arena. So, I mean, it was right off of ha- between Alpha of Hampton there in Oakland right. there, on Clayton, and it was just a little gem of a place right by the Channel 2 Tower there, uh, ABC Tower there. And so w- working there, it was like going to school and getting paid great money. I mean, there were so many great— and just about everybody that worked there ended up opening his own restaurant. Yeah, so you knew all, all these people, guys. too. So it's marinating, if I can use that term, in you a little bit. You're probably you're not just learning from the bottom up, busboy to waiter or whatever, but you're looking to see how these places are run. You're also probably gathering recipes and, you know, seeing what's working and what isn't. And well, why'd you take that off the menu? And why'd you add that to the menu? And why is that the most popular you know, thing on the menu at all these different places? And you're starting to probably think in your own mind, maybe, I don't want to put any words in your mind, but that you'd love to own and run your own restaurant. Oh, I, I knew that. Like I told you, at 13, I wanted to be like, you know, Lou. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. that, I love that life. And uh, so anyway, uh, I kept pursuing it, and I worked there for years, and— um, was go, then open, they opened up a bunch more pasta houses. They were Rich and Charlie's Pasta House. Charlie was tragically killed in a pli- private plane crash. Mm-hmm. And by the, when they opened up, when they opened up Rich and Charlie's Trattoria, where I, where we were working, I was working there with my cousin Charlie Gito. Yeah, we were the two assistant waiters. I mean, we were making table side Caesars. Bone and Dover soles. I mean, it was it was you know we're wearing tuxedos sure. every night. You're doing everything. We're, yeah. we're, we're you know we're and we're having a ball and making great money. So then we went to um, uh, from there they were opening up these other restaurants and so we were helping open up the other restaurants and when they opened up Rich and Charlie's Trattoria they needed some money so they brought in a third partner a guy by the name of John Ferrar. So then John Ferrar became partners with Rich Ronzio and Charlie Mugavero, and they opened up more restaurants, like Rich and Charlie's Pasta House. Right. And they were, like, not so fine dining, just pasta houses, great salads, great pastas, and stuff like this. Casual. And casual, mm-hmm. yeah. And But, boy, we started. I worked there, and then they brought in two guys who ended up being the— with everything because when Rick, Charlie died and then it was Joe Fresta who I knew all my life. He was a carpenter for my uncle Frank Cachatori's construction company. <laughs> and I mean, I knew him all my life. He was a few years younger than my dad and my uncle, but Joe Fresta was a great guy and we're still friends to this day. And John Ferrar, who I knew all those guys and Richard and all of them from the Hill, and they were opening up these restaurants, and Kim Tucci, mm-hmm. and Kim Tucci was so Joe Fresta was a carpent was a carpenter, and he was he was best friends with Richard Ronzio. Right, he was Richard's guy that he brought in, and Kim Tucci was close friends with John Ferrara. Kim Tucci knew the restaurant business. He worked at Tony's downtown. He worked for Vince Bomarito. Tony's was the number one, big, yes. one, number one Italian restaurant in the world and the country at the time. It was the only mobile five star fine dining Italian restaurant in the country. And Vince Bomarito, I worked there for three years, 76, 77, 78. I was actually working there in 79 when I moved to Kansas City. Right. But it, it was the re- restaurant in St. Louis. And right. They, uh, it was a classic. Vince was like the Vince Lombardi of the restaurant business. So Kim knew the restaurant business. Joe was a carpenter, but <laughs> it was, it was. It worked. It worked. It, it worked. worked yeah. And those guys were very, very essential right. in growing it with John Farrar, the right. three of them. And Richard was still alive then, but Richard was just. Richard was just at the racetrack. He loved he, he, he <laughs> betting the ponies. He, he, Richard loved to gamble. He, he was he was bet whatever he could bet. Yeah, he, he used to say, I'll, "I'll bet any man from any land, any amount he can count 
on any game you can name. <laughs> <laughs> that is classic. Okay, so you are really involved in the St. Louis Italian restaurant scene. Correct. How and when did you make the decision, pack up and leave, and move to Kansas City? Well, I was working at Tony's by then. Okay. I worked in to Tony's 76, 77, 78, early 79. And I remember I started at Tony's. I was only 20. And I kind of lied to get the job there. And then... Kind of? Well, <laughs> I told a little white lie. I was, turning I was turning 21 in November, you know. And I might have started in, like, September or August. <laughs> That's not too bad. But I wanted to work there because it was the restaurant to work at. And it was a classic restaurant. I mean... Unfortunately, when they built the trans, when the Rams came, mm. they took the restaurant by eminent do domain, and it's like my original Gro Garozos. I mean, the right. restaurant had character. It was an old building, freestanding building. It was downtown on Broadway, right across the street from the Greyhound bus station. But Vince <laughs> had the safest corner in the in, oh, in, yeah. in downtown. Just Saint like Louis. you have the safest <laughs> corner. <laughs> yeah, so he. Um, He's um, he, working for him was like going to school and getting paid great money. I even did a deal. We do these little things on our uh, on our uh, Instagram, uh, uh, our social media called That's Life. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go downtown, we got all the celebrities on the Wall of right. Fame and stuff. And I tell stories about the guys uh, from Tony Bennett and Paul Newman, all the people that have been in there. Right. Kid Rock. We're talking about like your that. restaurant now. Yeah. yeah. But <clears throat> I, I, anyway, I, I just did one on Vince Bomarito after he died ab about a year and a half ago. He was 89 years old or something, still going to work every day. But um, I, I, I honestly said I w learned how to run a, more from Vince Bomarito on how to run a restaurant the right way than all the other guys combined. Mm hmm and, I mean, he ran a restaurant like nobody else. But uh, he was he was the Vince Lombardi of the restaurant yeah. business. So, so the decision then for you to leave there had to be tough, Well, wasn't it? my cousin, <clears throat> a, a guy by the name of Sam Garozzo, and another Italian friend of mine named Chris Fregali from The Hill, they were working at the original Fanny's in, Saint, in Kansas City, and then Fanny's burned down. Right. Chris's mother... Uh, married this multimillionaire, and he bankrolled him in a in a restaurant, and he asked my cousin to be his partner. So they were opening up this fine dining restaurant in Kansas City. It was called Papillons. It was opened up in '79, early '79, and I moved up here in May of '79. I took a leave of absence from Tony's to come up and get him help him out for a couple months. Okay. And uh, so when I, when I did that, at that same time, just about a, a year earlier, Rich and Charlie's, they were going through a lawsuit with Charlie's family for using the name, so they called it Rich and Marty's Pasta House, opened in Ward Parkway Shopping Center. Okay. And it was open, and all the Italian guys I knew from the Hill were out there. So we had all the Italian guys from the Hill working at Papillon's in the fine dining restaurant. This was like a Rich and Charlie's pasta house, only right. called Rich and Marty's. Marty Ronzio was one of Richard's nephews that was one of the partners mm -hmm. then, too. Still is, has his own Rich and, uh, Rich and Charlie's in St. Louis, South County. And uh, anyway, so it was called Rich and Marty's and Sam Giudino was working there, and he, he, he was a good friend of mine, Sam, and I have been. And so we'd go out there to see them and have drinks after mm -hmm. work, and that's when I met this little hostess named Maggie Canzanari. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got hit by the thunderbolt, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. We've all seen The Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, you know, I'm uh, 40, 40, well, that was 1979, so 30, 40, what is it, 44 years? Yeah, About 44 years, yes. 44 mm -hmm. years later. She wouldn't go out, out with me. I was 23. She was 17. Oh, my gosh. I saw those yeah. big brown eyes, 
and uh, she wouldn't go out with me till she turned 21. I mean, till she turned 18 in December. So finally, but I I would go up and see her, and you know, yeah, I know, and all that mope stuff. around, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of hang out with her, but we didn't, she wouldn't introduce me to her dad or any of that uh-huh, stuff. Right, her right. parents were divorced, and <clears throat> I finally got to meet him. And you know, he was the Italian half of her. She, yeah, her mother uh, was American. I think they came over on the Mayflower. Her family, the Petty Pilgrims. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Anyway, so, but uh, so you know, the four kids. Uh, we got. <laughs> <laughs> Our twelfth grandkid in the oven. <laughs> so, so Maggie was the one who said, "I'm not. You, you may go back to St. Louis, but I'm not going with you." Well, no, was it one of those? Well, no, it wasn't one of those. It was. This was home. This is where I was working. We were working here. I, I was working at, by then after. Papillon did make it. Those guys right. were too young, and they were into partying mm-hmm. and other things and. Uh, the restaurant was a great restaurant, but they were not really ready to have their own <laughs> restaurants and to be adults. To be adult. <laughs> so uh, it closed down, and I stayed up here, be- and I, I started working at Rich and Charlie's for a little bit until Fanny's opened. Yeah, right. And then when Fanny's opened in October of eighty, uh, was it maybe July of eighty? Then I went to Fanny's. Started working for Victor Fontana, rest yeah. of soul. And Victor was a great guy, and uh, we were great friends uh, up until his death. He died about, God, he's probably been dead 10 years now yeah. or, or more. Yeah. And, and uh, I remember Fanny's. Yeah, so mm-hmm. we worked there, and I met all, all the high rollers of Kansas City used to come in there, and I ended up running that restaurant. And so when that place closed— when Fanny's closed and it became Checkers, right. I went to work for the Pastelli's down at the Marriott downtown mm-hmm. and started running the banquet department. And I had made a friend uh, called named Gene Pereira. You know, my good, know our, our good friend. Our Gene good now. friend, Gene. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Gene would always see me over there and he'd see me at these banquets and business banquets and stuff and weddings and things like that. And he'd always see me, he said, what are you still doing working mm-hmm. here? How come a, 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 a an Italian restaurant guy with your talents doesn't have his own a, own restaurant yet? And I, I used to tell him, I said, Gene, I said, I'm just a poor Italian kid with the from the hill, you know. I don't have any money to open a restaurant. He says, I'm the president of a uh, 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 of, of a bank, Mike. He said he was working for uh, for um, from Frank Morgan at Merchants Bank. He was the president there. But when I first met him, he was the president of Mark Twain's bank, mm-hmm. Mark Twain Bank. But he says I give away millions of dollars every day. Find a <laughs> joint, and come see me. So uh, anyway, so I was doing great at with the Pastelli's over there at the hotel, and Kevin and uh, Phil and they were at the time they still had the Alameda and they had the Raphael. Mm-hmm. They were gonna op- They were building a new Alameda Plaza in Clayton, in which St. is Louis. near St. Louis. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's in St. Louis. And I was gonna go in there. I was in line to be the food and beverage director there. So I was thinking, oh, this is gonna be great. I'll get to move back to St. Louis, go back to the hill, be with my family, my brother, my sisters, and all my cousins and right. aunts and uncles and everybody. And um, I'll go back to St. Louis, and uh, I'll get paid to move back, and Maggie and I could go live there and uh, it would be live perfect. happily ever after. <laughs> so in the middle of that, the Ritz Carlton came in, and it bought the Alameda Plaza mm-hmm. on the plaza. And the Alameda Plaza, they were building in Clayton, which is still a Ritz Carlton there. I just stayed there uh, a couple years ago for a friend of mine. They had the uh, friend of mine's daughter's wedding. The wedding group stayed there and, yeah. and at that hotel, so it brought back some kind of good memories for me. Yeah. So at that time, I was just devastated. I was so upset. So a friend of mine, a guy named Joe Cervello, uh, 
not to be confused with Savala. Savala. Okay. Mm-hmm. Joe is a uh, father was owned a lot of parking lots downtown. He, in fact, owned so many parking lots downtown that he had a he had to, they made him sell some because he had a monopoly on them. <laughs> so Joe didn't have a lot of restaurant experience, but opened a restaurant. So we were going out. It was uh, end of March. I'm still trying to get find time working 50 hours a week at the hotel and. I had my I have a, I was a licensed real estate agent at the time on the side. I went and got my real estate license in Missouri and Kansas, hustling a few more bucks sure. trying to sell some homes on the side, which is <laughs> it's really a full time job real estate. Try to do it part time and work fifty hours a week, fifty five hours a week in a hotel is kinda hard to do and manage that plus raise two kids with my wife. My wife was a was a waitress. She was working at Stroud's my, for my good friend Mike Donegan, rest right. his soul. I got her a job there, and she was making great money there. And I then, then she went, well, anyway, long story short, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting off target here. So Yeah, uh, go back to, uh, okay, you see Gene Pereira, and he says, I hey. I saw Gene Pereira, <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I get off on this. That's okay. So you Gene, got stories. So, so I, I, go to, I go to Joe's restaurant. Mm-hmm which is where the original Garozos is now. It was called Pranza Ristorante. And we went in there and had dinner there, and there was maybe three or four tables in there. It was like a Wednesday night, or I don't know what week night, midweek night. And Joe called me up the next day, and he was there. He says, just check, how was everything last night, Mike? I said, oh, it was real good, Joe. You yeah. know? Wink, wink. Yeah, it, <clears throat> it was just so, it was Okay. Yeah, it was. I said it was everything was good. I said I love the restaurant, Joe. I said, kind of reminds me of pulling up to the restaurants on the hill where I grew up. And uh, he said, "Do you like it enough to buy it?" He says, "I want out." And I asked him how much and what he wanted. He wanted thirty five thousand. I'm like, okay. Okay, the rent was cheap, five hundred a month. <laughs> so, oh gosh! So I knew I could make that ends meet, and uh, uh, the, the my landlord, Junior Nigro, the the restaurant was years ago was a famous restaurant called Lucian's, st- short for Luciano's, and Lucian, you know, if, if you notice that restaurant doesn't have windows, they're all bricked in because. Lucian had it. It was a front for a bookmaking and crap game. So he took all the windows out. They're all bricked in with different bricks. And, and the restaurant's got a lot of character. It's tough to shoot through history. brick, too. Oh, my gosh. So anyway, so I, uh, I'm i like, well, let me go see Gene Pereira. So I called Gene up, and I went down and brought my financial statement and was not a thing of beauty, but I had good credit, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> he says. So I go in there, and you know, they take it before the committee, and Gene tells me, he says, we're, we're going to make what you call a good guy loan. Where he says, you're upside down on your house. Your house, cars are not worth what you owe on them, <laughs> he says. But you got good credit. <laughs> thank God for that. He says, we're going to make what you says. If the restaurant don't make it, you give me your word, you pay me back. I said, my word's my bond, and I've mm-hmm. never stiffed anybody. That's the way I was raised. Right. I'll pay you back. If, I don't care how long it takes me. I will never beat you out of a dime. He says, you got the loan. And I kissed him on the lips. Oh, of Maggie. course you did. Called Maggie. So we got the joint. Well, little did I know, you know, I had to put down all these deposits on the utilities. <laughs> so I bought the business for thirty thousand, and I was going to keep five thousand for a bank. So I borrowed thirty-five thousand. I paid thirty thousand. It didn't look anything like it did now. It was beat up, and it needed a lot of love. And uh, so I did. Uh, let me get a little drink of water. Yeah. I did. I uh, 
I, I, I got the loan, but I had to make all these big deposits mm -hmm. for the electric company, the gas company, the water company. Me it was wiping out my bankroll before I started. So I didn't want to go back to Gene and tell him I needed more money already. Right. Because he's already made a good guy loan. <clears throat> so I called my brother, who's four years younger than me, hasn't made a tenth of the money I've made, but, you know, I... I'd make it and spend it. And my brother still got his first communion money. <laughs> so, and and uh, so I called my brother and said, listen, I said, I need a, I, I said, Rick, I need uh, a $5,000 loan. I'm buying a restaurant. So he, he says, all right. He says, so he comes up. He, sa he says, let me come up. I'd like to see it. And he says, he he brings the check uh, brings me the check and, and the money with them and I I tell him I says you know this is the restaurant I'm showing it to him and right. everything and I told him I says Rick you know if you want to invest it in the restaurant you could have that would make the whole investment forty thousand you could have twelve and a half percent of the restaurant for five thousand and just be a silent partner I'll do all the work right because you know. If you want to do that, if not, and my brother looked at it, he says, I know you'll pay me back. He said, I'm just going to load it to you. I don't, I don't want it in the middle of this. But needless to say, he doesn't quite remember the story like yeah, that. I'm sure he doesn't, yeah, at this point, yeah. So anyway, but uh, – I've made it up to him in other ways through the years. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. you have. And so you, you get everything squared away, and I'm sure you took it step by step. Step by step. Yeah. You know, we, fortunately, you know, we, they had 15 employees, 13, 14 employees when, when I bought the place. And I had a meeting with them. I'm keeping the ball on board. I fired 10 of them the first week. <laughs> they busted the last guy. And I knew a lot of restaurant guys in town and started calling my friends and had a few friends coming in to help me out, which I needed guys that knew what they were doing. And got a couple good waiters. I got a cook, some guys that I knew to come that sure. were friends of mine that would help me out. And got my first chef, Anthony Ferrara, who I worked with at Fanny's. He he worked in the disco. He was Victor's nephew mm -hmm. and um, Victor's sister's son. And uh, Anthony and I were good friends, and he came and worked in the kitchen. He knew Victor's recipes, but he didn't know mine, so I had to teach him how we, how I made sugu and how I made mogu and, uh, and how I made spadinis and stuff. But right. uh, he was a big help. I couldn't have done it without Anthony's help. And I... I Worked in the kitchen, but I concentrated on the floor because I knew in my restaurant career, 90% of the complaints were always on service. Right. And service and out there, I could meet everybody and make sure everybody that came in that door, our, our company motto was and still is, when somebody walks in the front door of a Garozo's restaurant, it's like they're coming to my home for Sunday dinner. Mm -hmm. So... And that's how, you know, that's how they're, we want them treated, and that's how we built our business. So yeah. I was there, but every Saturday night I was in the kitchen expediting, and, you know, I would be there open to close. I was closed on Sundays because I needed a day off. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I was absolutely. 80 hours a week, but I loved it. I was having the time of my life. Yeah, and um, Zagat rated uh, 2001. You were the restaurateur of the year. 2017, you were... Um, the president of the Greater Kansas City Restaurant uh, Restaurant uh, Association, Association. Yeah. and in 2021, you were best Italian restaurant pitch Ingrams Casey oh, Magazine. But that's every year. <clears throat> that, that's, that's every, a, yeah. every year. We've won. Yeah, we've won. I don't know how many golds in Ingrams Magazine for. Before they had the Italian category it was best ethnic. And yes, we, that's right. And I think we've. They had like a Hall of Fame for guys that have won over 20 of them and Strouds and us and Jack Stacks. Right. They had a big picture. I was out of town, but they put us all on the cover of of the – when they had the picture, Maggie and I were out of town. I wasn't yeah. coming back to get in the picture. But I let my 
director of operations, my brother-in-law, Chris Canzanieri, Maggie's brother, who's my top employee, mm -hmm. been with me, started out from the beginning as a salad boy at 15. Wow. When we opened up and, yeah. you know, it was a long time ago. Yeah, so. and, and for you too, Mike, it's always been my family. I mean, yeah. you know, you can tell just by the way you're talking, all the people, you, they might not even be cousins or even related, but they're all, they've all become your family. And I think that right. you see that every time you go in your restaurant, I see so many people, you know, you come in, you know, whenever and it's, 10, 12, 15 years going in there, longer than that even, but just the idea that they're still the we're, same we're people in there when they walk in the door. Frank. Yes. We're seeing generations, <laughs> people that came in as kids mm -hmm. with their parents, mm -hmm. were, do, were, were doing their rehearsal dinners or were catering their weddings and our catering business, knock on wood, has been yeah. killing it. We're doing over 200 weddings a year off property, just, just weddings and it's just, uh, I got a great uh, team there. My uh, director of catering, Tanya Round, has just been a rock star for us. I've been blessed by having some good people. And, uh, you bet. When I, when I get the good ones, I, I take care of them and yeah. keep them. You know, I, but, you know, you have turnover, too. And oh, it's sure. Every, every so often, you know, you, you, you have a... And I'm going through some of that now, and so I'm working a little harder than I want to. Yeah. At this st stage in my career, but you know, I'm I'm not going anywhere. Everybody says, "What's your exit strategy?" I'm like, <laughs> "Well, um, I'm not quitting, and they can't fire me. I guess I'm going out of here feet first. <laughs> I'm, I'm I going love out my of, job. <laughs> I know. I'm going out here with my my face in the pasta, <laughs> most likely. Okay. You know, I'm sorry." Uh, uh, the, the, my face in a chicken spadini. Okay, the chick. Where's chicken spadini began, which right. is your big slogan for you. Well, Talk well, about that. I got to tell you about that. My <clears throat> uncle Fred, who was uh, my dad, died when I was a young man, and uh, he was a father to me. And but we were so close before that, and all my life he's been a big part of my life because he never got married. He was a playboy and just a class 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 guy and a man's man every which way but loose and um, <laughs> him and my dad were always partners in everything whatever all the things that they did together and best friends and you know they they had two older brothers my uncle charlie and uncle tony that were both older than them they were both in world war 1 my oh, dad gosh. and my uncle were in the korean war wow but they had my grandmother had four miscarriages between my dad and my uncle, and all four, all all the kids were born premature. Oh, they gosh. put them in ovens. Yeah, right. They back were in born those days, in the yeah. house. Every time I go <laughs> to the, the we we we'll put them in the oven the hill, in the house I, I, by the by the house. <laughs> The, the, the midwife, they, come, they, that's where they stuck them. And they, they warned they, they the oven? Have incubators. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, my dad was like, and my uncle were both premature, and so were their older brothers, and they had four that, there would have been eight brothers, but four of them that didn't make it yeah. in between my Uncle Tony and my dad. So, and so, um, anyway, um, every time we drove by that house on the hill on Marconi, my dad said, I was born right up there, son, on the third floor, that window right there. <laughs> I said, Dad, I know it, Dad. Every time we go to St. Ambrose Church, we go to Amagetti's Bakery to get bread. You tell me that as we drive by. <laughs> I'm sure you say the same thing to your kids and your grandkids about something in Kansas City with you and Maggie. But then you and Maggie, you had... Uh, you know, talk a little bit about that. I know you're celebrating a, yeah. a big anniversary. Big and anniversary. Four, we, got, we got four, four daughters. daughters, yeah. That long, I, I broke the long string of, of, of Garozo males and went all women. So, uh, and uh, uh, I was blessed four girls. Uh, my oldest daughter, Gina, is 38, and my baby, Sophia, is 30. Right. So we've, uh, I know you're, your beautiful wife, Sarah, mm -hmm. the princess, as you call the her, princess. has sung at a few of those yeah, weddings. I think so, yes. <laughs> We've attended a few of those, yes. Yeah, so, um, I love the cookies. When I got the, <clears throat> Maggie's got the cookie table. Nah, yeah. And uh, after that last wedding, I'll tell you what, 
when I walked her down the Sophia down the aisle on the rehearsal dinner, I handed her to Joseph. Said, "Here's her passport. <laughs> here's her birth certificate. Here's her first <laughs> communion certificate." I said, "She's your problem from here on out." <laughs> That's it. I'm like, you know, I never realized how much money I made till I got that last one. I got them all. You know, got them all out of college. Uh-huh. I had shit. I had I, Frank. I had. I had uh, years. I had one at St. Louis University, one at Cornell, and two at St. Teresa's. I had two years like that, where my tuition, uh, my tuition was over a hundred thousand a year. Wow! Back in and what what year would that have been? Well, Probably back ten years back, ago. So about oh that. no no, I'm saying twenty years ago. Sophia graduated from high school in eleven. Okay. So she graduated from, the baby graduated in 11. Yeah. And that's how I remember Gina graduated in 03. Yeah. And there's eight years difference. Between. Believe me, I have trouble with the math, too. Yeah. Yeah. I've, so I've if, I, if I remember those two, I can right. re- remember all their ages, too. And then in Maggie, God bless her, we call her St. Maggie Saint for Maggie. a reason. Okay. Yeah. And you've been married uh, 40 years? Uh, October 29th. Yeah. Well, I, I told her we beat the over and under by 30. <laughs> She said, we haven't hit it yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely true. And in the restaurants, you spawned a few more off of them as well. Right. Some but other now we're, restaurants, we've, yeah. we've trimmed it up. You've you trimmed know, it and back. It's yeah. so hard finding help. And, you know, sometimes less is more. We got the the original downtown, right. which is the mothership. And that place is cranking. We've got it looking real good now. We've got... We use my office as a private dining area, and uh, at night, and we got the VIP room upstairs. I'm right uh, thinking about changing the name of it to the Frank Sinatra room or the Tony Bennett room up there. And we just put a beautiful new bathroom up there and did some fine tuning up there, right. and then. We got the back, little back porch downtown now. That mm-hmm. it's a good time of year for that to be opened up and good to go. Also have the, um, you know, the downstairs area. Which so we seat, you know, probably a uh, hundred and fifty people down there. Wow! Now which just awesome. Which uh, uh, you know, it doesn't look like that big, but. It's amazing what that if you see the size of that little kitchen. Yeah, what that kitchen pumps out. It's, it's just, amazing. It's a. It's I love a, the bar in, in yeah. the in the original uh, yeah, restaurant. So. It's just just awesome. And then okay. we got Overland Park still. So. Yeah, right. Back to the beginning though. One of the things we did that really was very helpful. Uh, a good friend of mine, rest his soul, a guy by the name of Frank Martino, had Northeast Painting Company, mm-hmm. and. Uh, he used to come in for lunch all the time, and I, I used to tell him I just love this neighborhood. It reminds me of the hill. You know, it was the old North End. It's Columbus Park. Right, it's Columbus where Park. Where I said, you know what we ought to do, Frank? I said, you got the painting company. I said, I'll buy all the paint. Let's paint the fire hydrants red, white, green, white, and red like the ones on the hill in St. Louis. I said, I'll pay for all the paint. You guys do the labor. Yeah, that's a great idea. So anyway, I guess we just painted it. Frank didn't get permission. To it. <laughs> now, right. now, that, now the fire department's <laughs> in, a, in an uproar. They're coming. So the Kansas City Star comes down. I've been open about maybe four or five months, and we're starting to get busy. I mean, uh-huh. we're starting to kick in. The word spreading out. We got good food. I'm getting good people in there. I'm cleaning things up. Every t- I'm making money. I'm putting it back in. I'm making it. Paying off through. Gene. Pay- oh, I-, I paid off the loan in three months. Mm. I paid it all. I couldn't wait. I gave myself a raise from 500 a week to 800 a week. I was thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> and then I-, I retired Maggie then. Yeah, right. Said, you finally get her out. I had of, to get her out of there. She was yeah. driving me nuts. But I love her to death. But it's hard working with with your wife. Oh, absolutely. Especially yeah. in, in, in in a restaurant. So I'm not going to say a word because I work with my wife on this. So I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to leave it right there. Okay? <laughs> the princess. The princess. Of course, yes. Go. But anyway, so um, <laughs> we painted them and the Kansas City Star comes down <laughs> to interview me. But I'm like, uh, 
he, the guy says he wants to get a picture of the thing. I'm like, wait a minute, don't take it like that. Can you take it here? And he's got a picture of me next to my thing with the Garozo sign in the, yeah. back, in the background. So I'm thinking, oh, well, the article, I'm like, we thought we had permission. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm trying to give back to the community. I'm, that's right. I'm trying to be a good neighbor, a good and yeah. oh uh, gosh, that's every, you know, remind me of the hill where I'm from in St. Louis, and this is Columbus Park. He's yeah. Italian, Christopher yeah. Columbus. So anyway, uh, it, it ends up I I, I think well, the, maybe they'll put it the, uh, the article, and hopefully they'll use the picture, probably be in the back of the yeah. star. Mm -hmm. Front page. Front page. I Front remember. Front page yes. of the star. Yes. Me and get a phone was ringing <laughs> off the hook. How come you didn't tell me you opened up a restaurant? Everybody I'd ever met, I moved here in 79, and I got around town pretty good, mm -hmm. you know, working at all those great restaurants at Fanny's and for, for the Pastelli's, right. and I started getting all the Italian restaurants sure. in down there and all the Italian weddings and stuff at, at the hotel, and... Well, I had my daughter's weddings at the Mule Box, three, three of the four, mm -hmm. until the baby Sophia, she didn't want hotel roof food, so I had to cater it. Of course. Which I lose double because I couldn't <laughs> book a paying customer that <laughs> night. <laughs> but Sophia got her way. Oh, and the, the youngest one always does, right? Oh, yeah. Because you're tired. Okay. Hey. Uh, we all know what a great restaurateur you are, and food is fabulous. The restaurants are doing great. You're doing great. Maggie's doing great. Kids are doing great. Two things you probably don't know about this guy. Number one, he's in the movies, okay? Number two, he can sing. Before we get to the singing, okay, talk about the two movies that you were You were in two movies, right? Uh, you well, you did little bit parts. As, what I, else? I, well, the, the, movie, <laughs> the movie Kansas City. Yes. Okay, believe it or not, they typecasted me as a gangster. I can't understand that at all. <laughs> so all the... The, the movie Kansas City, the Robert Altman film. Yes. Robert Altman being from Kansas City, that he wrote it and everything. And they were all in town filming the movie. And they were looking for Italian actors. And uh, the, the casting director came in the restaurant. Timing. For, for, for lunch and <laughs> heard me talk and she just saw me and everything. And she said, we want you to come down. We want you to audition for this we, we're looking for Italian guys. We're, there's some some uh, history in the Kansas City sure. crime history in there, and uh, we want you to uh, read for read some scripts for it. So I go down there, and I was I wasn't worried. I was just reading the lines. You yeah, know? You, you were being you. I, but <laughs> and and so I got a part. I got a part. I had you know I got this deep voice and. Uh -huh. You know, I'm full-blooded Sicilian. All four of my grandparents were born in Sicily. Right. I, Marlon Brando had to put cotton in his mouth to talk like me, Frank. <laughs> so, I, I, uh, anyway, um, so R Robert Altman heard me talk. He said, I want that voice here on every Italian scene. But I was so disappointed when I saw the movie because we shot scenes that never made the movie. Right, right. Spent three days on them where... We did a kill scene where I was telling, I mean, it, we did action out, the whole thing. And I played a guy, uh, if you look at the Kansas City history of organized crime, named Charlie Gargata. Mm -hmm. And he was like the underboss to, to uh, uh, Nick Savella mm -hmm. in, 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 that, in that deal. It, no, it wasn't, it was John Lazia. Back. John Lazia. Yes. John Lazia was say. before Nick Savella. Right. Nick came after John Lazia. So that's when, uh, so I played Charlie Gargata, and I had really one scene that got in there. And out of all the lines I had, I had about four lines in this scene. They used one line. I'm Charlie Gargata. We're here to help you get your wife back. <laughs> so it was about, a, the story was about a mayoral election. Right. Actually, they just had a, a screening of it. You're talking about Nellie Dawn. 
Are you talking about Nellie Don? No. Well, yeah, they got kidnapped. Yeah, she yeah. got kidnapped. She right. was James A. Reed had right. She had a baby but, with and, James and, A. Reed. And, and, and it was and uh, she got kidnapped because she's one of the richest women in America. Right. And during then, the uh, depression. Who yeah. was the guy? Pendergast. Yeah, Tom Pendergast. Tom yeah. Pendergast mm-hmm. called John Lazia. Well, Ron said, "Yo, uh, get, f- get her back." Another <laughs> friend of mine, rest his <laughs> soul. Uh, Joe DiGiolamo, rest his soul, played uh, John Lazio. Yeah, right. And he had a little, out of all his scenes, he got one phone call scene. Yeah, right. You know, well, that's what happens. Yeah. You know, Best but, of you is on the cutting room floor. Right? <laughs> they yeah. say that. And then you're in one other, you're in one other. Well, off of that movie, it sprang off of that. And I, I so I, I never got my SAG card because you got to pay for that. Yes, right. But I got rate. So they, the second movie, they wanted me to get my SAG card. I said, right. I'm not doing it. I'm not paying that money. Right. I, I, I'm never going to get another movie. I'm not going to pay to get a SAG card. Right. So they let me do it. And I actually got two of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, anyway, they came in. I, I played. They had me read the, for an Italian cop. But I ended up getting what you, we call a spicy scene. Uh-huh. I, I played a cab driver which I got to get out of my car. And uh, the movie had Kristen Davis, one of the gals from Sex and the City. Right. Really beautiful young lady. And um, she was who, who my cab fare was. Yeah, right. And then this other cop was chasing her out. She, <laughs> the name of the movie was, was uh, Deadly Visions. Okay. The name of the movie was Deadly Visions, and she would have these dreams about these murders that were being committed, and then they happened. And so she was telling the police department about it, and Peter yeah. Boyle, who was Everybody Loves Raymond's That's father, right, yeah. he played the, the, one of the cops in it, and I remember when uh, he was in it, and, and I forget who the other cop was, a young actor. I don't know if he's still acting or not, but he was supposed to be an up-and-coming one. So I pick up Kristen Davis. She's leaving the police department. I'm in there, and I auditioned for it. They, they said, just, I said, what should I wear for the audition? Dress like a, a cab driver. <laughs> so I, I come to the audition. I just wore a plain black shirt, a plain back golf shirt, and one of those little, little Italian Yeah, I know caps. what you're, yep. A little, driving caps, a little mm-hmm. driving cap like the like they wore in the Godfather when yes. Michael was a go- uh-huh. when he met Apollonia and got hit by his thunderbolt. Right. So I had one of those caps on, and um, and then when I he said just wear what you wore for the audition, it was great. So I pick her up. Well, when I went to the movie, I had one with a Garozzo logo, <laughs> and he let me wear it. He let me wear Did it. Did he really? It was the only one that had it. So I had my Garozzo <laughs> logo in the movie. <laughs> Ultimate so, branding, yeah, yeah and, marketing guy. <laughs> you gotta get, you gotta capitalize. You, you gotta capitalize. So yeah. anyway, uh, so I pick up pick up Kristen Davis, and, and she gets in the car, and I start pulling away, and this cop, plain clothes cop, jumps on my car, stop, stop, and jumps on the top of my cab. I slam on the brakes, jump out of the car. I said, "Get off my car, before I give you a beating." <laughs> He flashes his badge at me. Oh, I said, big deal. You're a cop. You think that's all right? You can't jump on my cab. So then he starts talking to her, and she gets out. She gets out. She gets out of my. She gets out of my uh, my car, and, and she's opening. He opens the, the door for her, and she starts getting out. And I yell at her. Hey, what about my fare? <laughs> <laughs> so my nephew, my brother's son, every time I talk to him, he said, Uncle Mike, what about my fare? <laughs> <laughs> they never let you forget. Yeah. And folks, this young man sitting across from me, young, um, young, young guy. He's young a guy. young guy Yeah, right. compared yeah. to me. I'm, I'll uh, be 68 in November, Frank, they're, and their restaurant years are like dog years. I'm older than you in real life. <laughs> so not only, and you can imagine with a voice like that, he has to be able to sing, at least a little of Italian stuff. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you also. He is a huge St. Louis Cardinals fan still. Baseball. because Baseball because of his loyalty. But the Kansas City Royals are his American League team. Loves the Royals too. But he loves 
the Kansas City Chiefs. Okay, I mean he loves football. The is Kansas my passion. City. It is his well, passion. Yeah, as much as I love Cardinal baseball, that my my number one spot in my right. heart is the Kansas right. City Chiefs. And Mike Mike wrote a song, put it to music, which you're going to hear here in a minute. But I want him. But what I want him to do is at least one line of this song, and then we'll explain who you sang it to and who you showed it to and what happened after that. But give us give us just a quick preview of what we're going to see here on the screen. How lucky can one town be? We got Mahomes, Andy Reid, and Kelsey. Like Chris Jones once said, don't disrespect Arrowhead. All right, so there's Mike, a cappella. Okay, now we're going to put him to an orchestra, and then he's going to explain after it's all over who he showed this to and the reaction he got from the Kansas City Chiefs. This is terrific. Mike Garozo. I'm dedicating this song to my three favorite Chiefs in heaven, my good friends Derek Thomas, Bill Grigsby, and Walter White. <laughs> that is great. How lucky can one town be? Got my homes, Andy Reid and Kelsey. Like Chris Jones once said, don't disrespect Arrowhead. Playoff Frank had another huge sack. Joe Burrow was flat on his back. Like Travis said, quote, shut your mouth, know your place, you jabroni. Red Beach keeps the wheels spinning. With Big Red, we keep winning. Rookies are just beginning. Chiefs kingdom is beautiful. We don't care if we cover the spread. It's just like Chris Jones once said. Don't disrespect Arrowhead. <laughs> How lucky can one town be? Got my homes, Andy Reid and Kelsey. Like Chris Jones once said. Don't disrespect Arrowhead. Playoff Frank had another huge sack. Joe Burrow was flat on his back. Like Travis said, quote, shut your mouth, know your place, you jabroni. Red Beach keeps the wheels spinning. With Big Red, we keep winning. Rookies are just beginning. Chiefs kingdom is We don't care if we cover the spread. It's just like Chris Jones once said. Don't disrespect Arrowhead. Tommy Quick. How about Butker's big kick? Right in the Cincy Mayor's head. So don't forget, it's just like Chris Jones once said, don't ever, ever, ever disrespect Arrowhead. <laughs> that was great. Okay, so Mike, explain a little bit just the, the your idea about it, number one. Of course, you love the Chiefs. Uh, I know you love to sing. You love the Italian songs. This I'll tell was, you what, this was I, start, I started it out, we were flying out to the Super Bowl, and I, I'm in first class, Maggie's sleeping next to me, and I just started humming, how lucky can one guy be, uh -huh. you know, and uh, I just started thinking about it, you know, yeah, we got Mahomes, Andy Reid, Kelsey. So, you know, that kind of rhymes. Yeah, how long are they uh, Mahomes, Reed, and Kelsey? Yeah, okay. <laughs> how lucky can one town be? So right. I, I just started, then I I started writing, jogging stuff down and just started making it rhyme. And I, I always like to write stuff. I, I used to write a little poetry too, but mm -hmm. nobody knows about it. But I, I did it for myself. 
I wrote a poem about the St. Louis blues. I used to love the blues back in the old days. I still love my blues. I loved it when we beat the Bruins. It was a, one of the happy mo- I never thought I'd live to see the blues win a Stanley Cup or the Chiefs win a Super Bowl. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> that that was my, I, I, I said years ago, I said, i just like to live to see that because I'd seen, you know, the, the Cardinals win a lot of World Series in right. my life, and I've been to. You saw the Royals win one. I saw the I mm-hmm. saw the Royals win two. Uh, two. I'm sorry. I wasn't right. as happy about the first one. I know. That's, <laughs> that was the Cardinals. I'm glad that they did win it. I yeah. just wish it would have been reversed, and they would have beat the Phillies in '80, <laughs> and not the Cardinals in '85. <laughs> but you know what? It's okay. I, I, I love I love a lot of those guys from that team, and yeah. I'm glad. Guys like George Brett and them, that, uh, they, I'm guys. glad they got a world championship. And I know it makes it even better for them beating the Cardinals. Yeah, I know. So, <laughs> so, so then with the Chiefs, and you're flying to Super Bowl, and you're writing a song. I'm writing a song, and uh, I was just uh, – then I got obsessed with it. I couldn't sleep at night because I wanted to get it finished. I wanted to get it finished before the Super Bowl, so I sang it down at the – I had I got it done because the I went to media day with the eight ten guys, uh-huh. my good friend Chad Boger, yeah. and I sang it down there mm-hmm. at at, uh, at for eight ten sports, and then I sang it on Fox Four. They they uh, they interviewed me on uh, McGonagall did mm-hmm. Chris the morning show guy, which I, I can't get it anymore because of the uh, damn. Uh, it's back. Direct TV is back. back. It's back it's on? Back. Channel 4 is back? It's back. It's back. You're kidding me. I'm not kidding you. I've been worried sick. What was I going to do on those Chiefs games? But Because I can't. You, you, Direct TV lost the NFL ticket. Right. I don't they know got what it back. I, they got the NFL ticket back too? No. Well, well the, Chan, Channel 4 is back. Channel 4 is. Okay, Channel I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. I haven't even turned it all, on. All it took was the NFL season to kick off. And then all of a sudden, everybody went, oh, okay, I think we'll fix this. <laughs> yeah, the NFL is... They're the king. They're the kings. Okay. So anyway, um, then so, I sang it there, but when I, 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 I sang it for my friends. Right. A couple times before the game. It was really great because I sang it at a party for all my buddies that from Wolf Creek were at. Right. Uh, a buddy of mine, Bill Kruger and, and Dan Burke, have a, a, a real nice condo down there, and they had a party in the pri- the Friday night before the Super Bowl. And as the party thinned out at the end of the night, I sang it, and I just sang it a cappella. Right. And everybody loved it. They were all laughing and going crazy. And so then the next night, Saturday night, I went to my favorite Italian restaurant down down in the, in uh, Scottsdale. A place called Tutti Sante, where Leonardo, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, no Leonardo, no. Leonardo Zacchino okay. is the owner. He's from, he's from the old country. He's got phenomenal Italian restaurant there. I never go to the desert and not eat there. And he's a great guy. And so I go down there and uh, I uh, say all, all my Italian friends. From Kansas City, we're all at a table. Uh, Chuck Cuda, PJ Guastello, and their whole families. My my godson Marion Lombardo, mm-hmm. Mike Lombardo's son. They were all at this big table. They had like fourteen of them out on the patio, at at, at uh, Tutti Santi, and I was in there having dinner with my daughter Angela and her husband George, my wife Maggie. <clears throat> And my f- best friend Chuck Benjamina and his son Tommy, I, we were in there. That's who I was. The four of us were going. I took my son-in-law Benny to the game. Oh, my mm-hmm. son-in-law Benny Vitali. Mm-hmm. I, I took Benny and Chuck. So there were seven of us. So I went outside and I sang the song for them. <laughs> and they were all singing. Yeah, they were all singing it with me, you know, because they all knew the Dean Martin right. song. and. They were loving it. So then I came back, and my son-in-law, Joseph, who's been doing our social media and knocking it out of the park for us, he he set me up to do it at the studio, which 
I found out it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be <laughs> trying to get the verses into with the music right. already there. But uh, and it took us about an hour and a half to do it and uh, it worked out great. And so Brett Veach brings the all the scouts and their wives and all of his assistant GMs, Mike Borganzi and head director of scouting, uh, Bradway and all their wives and everybody. There was like 32, 34 of them. I give them the VIP room upstairs. This is after the draft. A the, after the draft. Right. The, the last day of the draft, the okay. Saturday night after the draft. And I got, the, I got a big screen TV up there, so I hooked it up to that. And I played it for them before, before the dinner, when I, after everybody got there, and after we, before we, we f served the first course, and they all went crazy. No, love it. They then they asked me to play it again after <laughs> dinner. So, you know, being the hand that I am, I was happy to ob oblige them. And so I sent it to Brett, who immediately sent it to Andy Reid, who texted me back, that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, absolutely true. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, Mike, I can't thank you enough. For coming and spending oh, some time with me today. Always a pleasure, Frank. I just, uh, I love you. You know that. Uh, We've had so many great times together. and We're going to have another one this weekend. We'll have another yeah. big one coming up here. Yeah, you bet. So uh, it, it's it's always a great thing. But truly, you and the restaurant, your family, and the way you've embraced this city and the way they've embraced you, you are one of the reasons there's just something about Kansas City. God bless you, my friend. I love you, buddy. I love you, too. See ya. Uh-huh.